Hi, and welcome to another episode of SwitchCast, a podcast delving into the world of film brought to you by the team at Switch. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Charlie David Page. I'm Daniel Lamon. And I'm Jake Watt. It's Thursday the 13th of September 2018. On this week's show, from Schindler's List to 12 Years a Slave, there are so many critically acclaimed films that bring historical atrocities to the big screen. But is it exploitative to be turning it into entertainment? And as always, all our reviews and giveaways. Let's get straight into it with The Predator. Daniel attacked this one head first, so is the fourth instalment of The Predator franchise a worthy one? I'll get to the chopper and let you know. <laughs> Much to the joy of hyper-masculine heterosexual bros everywhere, the iconic Predator returns to the screen, this time under the direction of the often excellent Shane Black, and with an unusually accomplished cast. So, should be a pretty safe bet, right? Wrong. Predators just don't sit around making hats out of rib cages. They conquered space. But that's not what's on the horizon. Should I be worried? Riley. I think you know what is on the ship. (laughs) The ultimate predators. Light him up! We may die. We're still here. So come and get us, motherfucker. Wobbling on the legs of a sticky taped together narrative that often makes no sense, filled with gaping plot holes and confusing relationships, The Predator is a real mess. Inconsistent in tone and lacking in, well... The Predator. You came for the kick-ass alien hunter, you're stuck with shady government agents, father-son dilemmas, ill-conceived jokes at the expense of mental illness, and predator dogs that no one asked to ever see again. There's too much shoved into this film, and yet it lacks any kind of spine to hold it together, and while the cast try their best, they seem just as confused as we are. As for the icon at the centre of the film, there's just not enough of them. Where the original had suspense and tension, this is just obnoxious noise, and barely any of the often graphic violence has anything to do with the thing from outer space that likes hunting people. Another thing we don't get to see the damn predator do. Whatever potential this entry had gets lost in the confusion, resulting in an action-adventure film that's not that funny, not that thrilling, and not that interesting. I'm sure the hyper-masculine heterosexual bros will love it nonetheless, but anyone hoping to see one of the great alien big bads continue to earn its franchise are going to be disappointed. Worse, they're going to be bored. One and a half stars. And that's mostly for the nice cinematography. You know how everyone's like super excited about the new Suspiria coming out? I mean, obviously, because they're human. Yeah, yeah. Thus, they must be. It has like tons of social media chatter. Everyone's kind of, you know, chomping at the bit to, to have a squiz at it. So, the Predator is my Suspiria. I am like ridiculously excited to see. I've seen the first Predator. I've seen Predator 2 with Danny Glover. I've seen both Alien versus Predators and um, as well as Predators. Do you recommend, Jake, as someone who's only just delving into the Predator multiverse, mm. do you recommend going and watching number two and Robert Rodriguez as one? Robert Rodriguez, he just he only produced that last um, the Predators movie. Yeah, but yeah, I think so. Like Predators, that has the dog in it, right? The Predator dog. Predators has like three Academy Award winning actors in it, and um and and uh, Predator dogs, and good, it's awesome. Good, like, it is just, it is just like an awesome. It's like a really uh, like super underrated movie. I'm not even really too sure why it was so unloved, but um I recommend watching that. Predator Two with Danny Glover and Gary Busey. I recommend um, seeing that as well because um, from what I've read, I haven't seen The Predator yet, but from what I've read, The Predator actually references like all the different Predator movies except for Alien vs. Predator, which like no one acknowledges exists anymore because they're so bad. Yeah. I mean, obviously. (laughs) Isn't in Alien vs. Predator, the winner is the Predator? Because I just don't agree with this. Kind of. Like the whole time, because when I watched the original Predator in preparation to watch this new one, all mm. I kept thinking was, the fucking Xenomorph would fucking take this this shit out. Like, what is it doing? What is it doing? Alien vs. Predator is just like sort of a full-on, like, you know, there's aliens and, and predators are like wrestling everywhere and all that shit. And um, you get to see, in the first one, you get to see three predators fight about a thousand aliens in a battle, which is so intense, it wipes out the Aztecs. 
Um, <laughs> it, it, that's, and that's like in the first five minutes Historically of the film. Historically accurate as well, yes. So if you're wondering what happened that, to them, that's, that's that what happened. That links very nicely into <laughs> what we'll be talking about later in this episode. <laughs> now, while uh, the Predator is all fun and games, there is a slightly serious side to it, which is that uh, Olivia Munn has come out and discussed the fact that she discovered that there was one of the actors who was kind of a bit of a supporting role. Uh, his name's Stephen Wilder Striegel who had actually been arrested previously and had prison time for being involved in an underage relationship online. But that does lead into this question of at what level is it appropriate for people who have particular felonies to be working on film sets, especially kind of this particular kind of felony in a post-Weinstein era? Yeah, I think that's the important thing, is that it's we're in the post-Weinstein Kevin Spacey era and... It's the process where Hollywood or filmmaking, well, actually, every, no, let's not restrict it to, to the to the film world, where every industry needs to reevaluate the way that it deals with people, particularly men who've committed terrible acts, and what is the process of redemption, and what is the process of allowing them to step back into the community, if that is appropriate at all, and what communities it is appropriate to step into. As much as there is, it's a complicated situation, I think that realistically this was the only outcome Hmm. that is possible. By which you mean that uh, 20th Century Fox cut him from the film, essentially. Yes, and that Olivia Munn was able to actually speak about how uncomfortable she was, because I think that's that's also quite an uncomfortable situation i mean it it does feel like a really big um break of trust on the part of the team behind um the predator they didn't uh, let olivia munn know that Mm. and she's i think she's completely within her rights to have pointed it out and have said that she was uncomfortable with it and to express concern about it i think um i think so as well like i i totally sympathize with olivia munn i just think it's kind of like you probably just like blame this one on, on shane black i just think it just he should have communicated more with you know, his cast members and his crew and, you know, he's also running like this, um, making this movie that's, you know, worth, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars potentially to a movie studio and mm. still pulling this shit. Like, it's pretty arrogant on his part to mm. to do that. Like, he, like you know, he's essentially like a the boss. So he has like responsibility to his shareholders and his employees and, and whatever. Yeah. And when you're hiring a mate who is in that kind of position, that's a mm. bit of an awkward situation to put kind of the rest of the cast and crew in. One thing the Living Man has said is that she doesn't want this incident to colour a people's readings of the film, and she hopes that she can that people will still be able to enjoy it, and she's very proud of the film. Um, so it, you can find my full review of The Predator at makethe-switch.com.au, and the film is in cinemas now. Also out today is Searching. Jake went on the hunt for this internet-based mystery, so did it leave you with a big smiley-faced emoji or feeling like you wanted to control-alt-delete? In director Anish Chaganti's debut film Searching, John Cho stars as David Kim, a father struggling to come to terms with the death of his wife. When his 16-year-old daughter, Margot, played by Michelle La, fails to return home following an all-night study group, David decides to report her as missing, and his case is assigned to Detective Rosemary Vick, a distractingly miscast Deborah Messing. Leave me a message or text me back. Hi, sweetheart. Um, just checking in because it looks like you already left for school this morning. Hey, Margot. Dad again. Why did you leave your laptop at home? I haven't been able to reach Margot. Wait, you can't find Margot? Study group only went till nine. She said it was going all night. No, she definitely left at nine. Authorities are asking anyone with information to please call the hotline or 911 immediately. Update me whenever you learn something. Did she mention anything unusual going on lately? We're not really that close. But you guys are friends. Kind of. She has friends, right? All, all I'm trying to do is to help you find my daughter. We need nothing from you. Where were you the night my daughter went missing? Searching Makes History is the first mainstream thriller headlined by an Asian American actor in Hollywood and presents its Asian characters free of cliches or stereotypes. The film is shot from the point of view of a range of media, from mobile phones, laptops, streaming video and news clips, similar to the found footage style. However, for much of this movie, it's just David frowning intensely at his computer. This visual style, while clever, does get a little boring because, hey, it's asking the viewer to stare at screens for 102 minutes, and there's this little thing called social media fatigue. Searching also doles out a series of red herrings that culminate in a plot twist that takes this film into traditional Hollywood thriller territory, 
You'll either think it's audacious or just kind of dumb and corny. While the narrative of searching strains against the confines of the film's aesthetic and the plot twists get bigger and sillier, it still represents another ambitious step forward for Asian American representation in cinema. Two and a half stars. I will agree with you on your last point, and I think that's probably the most, um, the one thing about searching to kind of celebrate is the fact that it is quite wonderful to see a, a cast predominantly made up of Asian American actors. Um, and also that the fact that Asian American is not part of the narrative, like mm. that it's, that's not imperative to the narrative, that they, it's, it could literally be anyone from anywhere, but the decision to commit to having an entirely Asian American lead cast apart from Deborah Messing um, is, is actually quite refreshing to watch, but it's about the only refreshing thing about searching. <laughs> I, I think I liked it even less than you did. Because I mean, wh- wh- I've always been very fond of the found footage genre, mm. but the one thing that I always get very antsy about with them is if you establish a series of rules or you establish a series of parameters, you stick to them. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, the narrative of searching is very Hitchcockian in, in a derivative sense. I mean, you can you kind of can see the twists coming before they come, and you know it's nothing's overly surprising. But the initial kind of charm of the film of seeing it told through everything that's available on a laptop screen was I found initially quite um, intriguing, and I was quite entertained by it. But I always have this thing of if you're doing a found footage film and you bring in a news report. To bring in exposition, <laughs> you've failed. Mm. And that was the point where I went, nah, you've lost me. Because you had a conceit, you stuck to the conceit in some really clever ways. Like some of the, the, the ways that David investigates what his daughter had been doing up until the point of her disappearance, of going through old address books, going through like breaking into um, social media accounts, um, going through old photos, all that stuff I was really, I really liked because it was like following a puzzle. As soon as you bring in a news report, on a website, the puzzle falls apart. Mm. And so all of a sudden, it just becomes you are not actively participating with David in the search for his daughter. You're watching David watching someone else look for his daughter. I like how the um, the, the sort of the camera on the news report like zooms in like ridiculously close yeah. <laughs> as well. Like sort of as, cl- as close as like sort of as if like a normal camera was like sort of filming him. And yeah. also as if this particular narrative was that thrilling and that mysterious that he would cause that much of, of, of a hoo-ha. That was the most, the thing I was like, <laughs> Missing persons do not grab this much attention. <laughs> the writing is kind of lazy. The sentiment is kind of lazy. The mm. score is very misplaced. Deborah Messing is good, but I don't. I, th- I agree with you. She's not overly well cast. I wouldn't. I wouldn't just really describe her as like a tough cop. No, no. Mm. I thought it flagged its twist very early on, and I spent oh. time on going. No, no, no. When is it? When are we going to find out that, that that this is the reason? Oh yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, I found the fact that it didn't stick to its rules quite lazy. Yeah, and um, it ruined it for me. I just um, that last twist, um, or the main twist, I guess, kind of really broke the movie for me. Like it was like I'm totally surprised by it, but at the same time, I felt it was like totally out of place with the kind of the tone the film had previously established. There were doors where the film could have gone on a really interesting, like particularly um, dissecting the way that people who only peripherally knew Margot suddenly became talking, like started talking about Margot as being their best friend with the kind of like uh, public. D- um, expressions of uh mm. of, of grief that happened because of the social media age I, like that i was like okay follow that path that's interesting but yeah the twist just kind of reverted it back to a lazy hitchcock you can find my full review at make the switch.com.au and searching is in cinemas now also out today is a simple favor the newest member of the switch team connor checked out this film on his first assignment and filed this review for us so A Simple Favor, which is directed by Paul Feig, who directed Bridesmaids and Spy, some of the most celebrated comedies in um, recent memory. And it stars Anna Kendrick and Blake Lively, and it is one idiosyncratic thriller. Uh, the central setup follows Anna Kendrick as Stephanie Smothers. She's an overeager single mother who quickly becomes enraptured in the lifestyle of her fellow mother, Emily, played enigmatically by Lively. The two characters begin to formulate a friendship, but it all is quickly upended when Emily disappears without a trace. And as the mystery deepens for Stephanie and Emily's husband, debauchery and murder soon follows. Stephanie, I need your help. Uh, are you okay? I'm fine, but I I do need just a a simple favor. Can you come over? Yeah. Five days ago, Emily went missing. You go poking around in her past, you're gonna find something that is 
terrifying. She was not a normal person like you or me. I've never seen such a beautiful girl want to be so invisible. I smell her, Sean. I smell her perfume like a ghost. Yeah, it's just you being paranoid. I saw my mom. She told me to say hi to Stephanie. I want to know your secret. The best thing that can be said about A Simple Favor is that when it gives in to its more melodramatic sensibilities, it is nothing short of a blast. The twists are shocking, some of the avenues the story chooses to explore is actually quite intense, and I say that also stating that you're grinning while that's happening, because the film itself is aware that it is intentionally over the top and convoluted and very much grinning along with you. And when it does that, almost serving as a parody of sorts to the films like Gone Girl and The Girl on the Train, films that are clearly its source of inspiration, it is one hell of a time watching it deconstruct those tropes. It does take a while to cement that identity however, and a fight for a definitive tone certainly plagues the best part of the first half of the film, but what you do have clearly is a cast well suited to their material and game to push the envelope. Same goes for the director in Fig, he is clearly reveling the opportunity to showcase what has been touted as his darker side. It's not perfect, but it is a lot of fun in the way a cult film like Serial Mom is. It's utterly bonkers and bizarre, but that's the distinctive feather in its cap. Go in knowing minimal and have some patience in the build up and you should enjoy it. I enjoyed it quite a bit and I want to give a simple favour, a modest recommendation of three stars. Well, isn't that exciting? New fella, <laughs> new voice to switch cast. It's quite a good review. I'm quite, I'm, I actually had absolutely no interest in seeing this film and now I have an interest. So thank you, Connor. Your contribution is valued. Well, I, I've got to say, I actually had an interest in seeing it because I am, like, as much as I um, I think Blake Lively is a bit on the cheesy side sometimes, I think she's a fairly... Excuse me, she was in The Sister to the Travelling Pants. You take that fucking back. You <laughs> take your mouth, put soap in it, you fucking wash your mouth. She was in The Sister to the Travelling Pants. Like, she's sacred. All I'm saying is she has some interesting choices in projects and I actually think she's a fascinating person to watch on screen. She's basically, as Connor described her, she is very enigmatic. She's very um, likable, I think. And I think Anna Kendrick has a very similar kind of style. I think she's a very uh, kind of every person. She's very easily relatable. So I think these two on screen together will be quite interesting. What, what really intrigues me is the fact that... Um, even from looking at the trailer and from everything that Connor wrote in his review, I have no clue what this film is about. <laughs> Which is actually um. quite lovely to go, to genuinely <laughs> look at a film and go, oh, I have no idea yeah. what this might be. But what what is nice is that it actually sounds like it is actually quite intriguing and is is worth watching for that reason. I mean, the other the, the thing that does kind of grabbed my interest about it and did when I first heard about it was the fact that it's directed by Paul Feig because I completely agree with Connor like Bridesmaids is a great film Spy is a spectacular film um, like he's one of the best comedy directors of the last decade um, certainly in American comedy and he's found ways to navigate around the kind of banality that Judd Apatow like has kind of left us with after completely like repeating his same trick over and over again. But I'm intrigued because this doesn't seem like the kind of project we're familiar with from with Paul Feig. It's, you know, it's not an outright comedy. And the last time I can think of a great comedy director stepping into like outside of the field of straight comedy was Adam McKay with The Big Short. Mm. And that was spectacular. So I'm hoping that like my hope with this is that we'll be able to see a different side of Paul Feig exploring different areas of his skill set. I mean, we know he's great with timing. We know he's great with performances. I agree. The cast of this is really exciting. So hopefully, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing this and it sounds like, sounds like it's going to be a winner. A modest winner, but a winner. <laughs> to tie back into our Asian theme from earlier from Searching, this film is the second to be released in as many months with Henry Golding in it because he is going to be everywhere in Hollywood. I, I still haven't seen Crazy Rich Asians, but I assume it's because he's pretty, right? Ugh, Daniel, you're a crazy white person for saying that. What, cause that, that, that I haven't seen it or that he's yes, pretty? Yes, because you haven't seen it. Well, I mean, I've been busy. <laughs> he's very attractive, yes. I, I, I saw that from the trailer. I mean, we could go back and listen to like, our reactions with the trailer, and I think most of it was just all of us just making very deep grunting noises every time the, his name was mentioned. Okay, we weren't recording pornography. 
No, but it was like watching pornography, that trailer. It's like, great comedy, Asian representation, and a very attractive man with abs. And Ronnie Cheng, what else do you want? Well, okay, that's one more reason to go see A Simple Favor, which is in cinemas now. And make sure you check out Connor's full review at maketheswitch.com.au. Also out today is Beast. Jake released the animal inside of him to catch this one. So, would you say this was a beauty? <coughs> Writer-director Michael Pierce's debut film, Beast, follows Mole, played by Jessie Buckley, a fragile young woman with a violent past. She lives a dull life in an upper-class home on the Channel Island of Jersey, which is ruled by her controlling mother, Hillary, a great Geraldine James. Mole gradually begins to assert her independence with the help of Pascal, Johnny Flynn, a handsome but rough-living outsider. That is, until a slew of creepy murders spreads paranoia throughout the tightly-knit community. You're wounded. I can face that. Where were you? I was worried sick. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being selfish. In captivity. So I'm going insane. There is speculation that the disappearance is connected to the unsolved murders three other girls over the past four years. You're a good person, Mo. You don't know me. I know that people make mistakes. The key selling point of Beast is the mesmerizing performances of Jesse Buckley and Johnny Flynn. Cinematographer Benjamin Krakan's masterful use of bold color, light and dark, formally composed and handheld shots, emphasizes environmental contrast and emotionally fraught mental states giving the film a distinctly English pastoral horror vibe. Unfortunately, once the film's attention shifts from Mol and Pascal's romance to focus on the usual whodunit mechanics, Beast starts to fall into some familiar patterns. The motivations of the characters are also left a little too ambiguous, to the point of confusion by the film's epilogue. These flaws aside, Beast is a tense, visceral character study that explores the feral sexuality and paranoia that can erupt in repressive environments. Three and a half stars. So this isn't about Jermaine Clements' ex-girlfriend, the Beast, from we, What We Do in the Shadows. <laughs> <laughs> that is, um, no, it is not. That is oh. such a <clears throat> such a rare cut. I was hoping. Have you watched um, that TV show yet? That was a, no, not yet. Not yet. I, I should, I should though. Anyway, I just wanted to interject with what I thought was a banger joke. <laughs> so please continue. <laughs> you were wrong. Often am. <laughs> Beast is Incentives now and check out my full review at maketheswitch.com.au. Also up today is Christopher Robin, the young boy who embarked on countless adventures in the Hundred Acre Wood with his band of spirited and lovable stuffed toys has grown up and lost his way. Now it's up to his childhood friends to venture into our world and help Christopher Robin remember the loving and playful boy he once was. Pooh, why are you here? Oh, yes, I need your help. I've lost all of my friends. Let's get to the bottom of this. Look up, Pooh. Here I come. Oh, oh. It would appear that I am stuck. Have you just eaten honey? I have not just eaten honey. I wonder which way. I always get to where I'm going by walking away from where I have been. Do you? That's the way I do it. Hello, Eeyore. Christopher Robin, it's you playing again. <laughs> Let's go and see if we can find Piglet. I've already stayed far too long. Hello, everyone. It's Christopher Robin! So nice to see you all again. Why, thank you. Silly old bear. So it's basically Hook, except without Julie Roberts and a bad haircut and more stuffed animals. Are you just going to spend the entire episode interjecting now? Yes. <laughs> uh, teen Titans Go to the Movies is also in cinemas from today. It seems to the teens that all the major superheroes out there are starring in their own movies. Everyone but the Teen Titans, that is. The Teen Titans head to Tinseltown, certain to pull off their dream, but when the group is radically misdirected by a seriously supervillain and his maniacal plan to take over the Earth, things go really awry. The team finds their friendships and their fighting spirit failing, putting the very fate of the Teen Titans themselves on the line. From the creators of Teen Titans Go! We are the Balloon Man! It's about courage. Titans Go! It's about action. It's the superhero movie to end all superhero movies. Hopefully. <gasps> he farted. That wasn't a fart. That was just air leaving my butt. Which is a fart. 
Teen Titans Go to the movies. Because if Aquaman can get a movie, anyone can. Also out today in limited release is Won't You Be My Neighbor? Charmingly soft-spoken and yet powerfully expressing his profound ideals on childhood and self-worth, American children's show host Fred Rogers was a unique presence on US television for generations. Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was a quiet and affecting alternative for children and families in a televisual sea of violence, noise, and slapstick. If you take all of the elements that make good television and do the exact opposite, you have Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Low production values, simple set, unlikely star. Yet, it worked. Hello. I've always felt that I didn't need to put on a funny hat or jump through the hoop to have a relationship with a child. He was always trying to get a message across in every show. A week on death. What does assassination mean? On divorce. Some people get married and after a while they're so unhappy that they don't want to be married anymore. He was radical. I know everyone says that, but he was radical. The greatest thing that we can do is to help somebody know that they're loved and capable of loving. Now let's take a look at our most anticipated film of the week in our trailer wrap. Legendary Scream Queen, Jamie Lee Curtis, returns to her most iconic role ever. Here's the latest trailer for Halloween. 40 years ago, on Halloween night, Michael Myers murdered three people. I have prayed every night that he would escape. Who the hell did you do that for? So I can kill him. Michael Myers escaped. He'll return to Haddonfield, his home. I need to protect my family. You have no security system, Karen. Mom, you need help. Evil is real. I've been preparing for this for a long time. It is not safe to be on the street tonight. Go home! Get out of here! Get inside! Michael! He's here. So off the bat, as a piece of advertising, this is a very good trailer. It's very well cut. The use of the layering of the theme is really good. I really like the fact that the the beginning feels very reminiscent of the beginning of the the original Halloween film, that amazing single tracking shot. Yeah, I think it's a really good uh, selling uh, tool for this film because it's got me completely convinced. And I wasn't overly Mm. convinced by the idea of doing another Halloween film Mm. or, you know, revisiting the franchise at all. But the from you know, how well crafted this particular this particular trailer has been, I am actually quite excited to see this one. It's a new theme, I think. I think jo- um, John Carpenter has actually gone back and re-recorded his original theme um, yes. with this kind of jazzy jazzy new one. It sounds pretty awesome as well. Yeah, because he's co-composing the music, and obviously we've got Jamie Lee Curtis back as Laurie. Um, but also Nick Castle, who played Michael Myers in the original Halloween, mm. is playing Michael Myers in this Halloween. Which is very cool. Which is yeah. very cool. I mean, we don't know that. Like, we can't see anything because yeah, it's it doesn't just actually matter, mask. really. But, but like, even just little it's... things like his physical <laughs> language, it's really nice to see something that is so accurate and so connected to the to the way that he moved in the original. I know mm. it's, we've only seen s- s- like snippets of it, but like the big thing I noticed the first time I watched this trailer was when he just moves, like turns his head, reminded me so much of the moment in the original film where he like, where you think he's dead, he sits up and turns his head and like the snap. That's the one of the really nice things about Myers as a villain is that his movements are so lumbering and direct, like, like an unstoppable force. Mm. So, and that, alone was something where I went, okay, this looks like an attention to detail is being given to revisiting this particular franchise. He has really good posture. You can tell he doesn't you know, <laughs> work in an office all day and no. stuff. That nice straight spine. He's spent a lot of time spent a long time in a mental posture in the asylum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, sit up, Michael. Good job, Michael. <laughs> Just sit up. Very good. Um, I'm pretty interested in this movie as well. Like, I'm not really too sure like why they chose to do a, a, a direct sequel to the very first movie when there's about a zillion Halloween movies. But um, like, David Gordon Green's a good director. 
and um, he shoots. He's mainly known for his comedy stuff, but he shoots. Um, his early dramas are pretty special. Yeah, his, his dramas are good, and he shoots like v- like violent scenes in like a really disturbing way. Mm. Yeah, I'm kind of interested to see what he actually brings to a horror movie. Well, we don't have to wait very long, thank God. Which is nice for once to have a film that would lo- that you're looking forward to this much, and it's not actually that far away. Because you can catch Halloween in Australian cinemas from the 25th of October, just before. Halloween. How ironic. Uh, how ironic. Very nice timing. And for all the latest trailers, head to youtube.com forward slash make the switch AU. There are no end to films that are based on a true story where real life situations are turned into films for public enjoyment. While stories like Schindler's List and 12 Years a Slave were critically acclaimed, it does pose the question should we be entertaining ourselves with historical atrocities and how soon is too soon? So the reason for this. Uh, conversation to kind of have popped up for us. It had been because of the uh, release of Paul Greengrass's latest film. His is one of two films we're being released this year around the um, Anders Breivik massacre on Ontoya Island um, in Sweden, where he, where Anders Breivik shot 77 people, 55 of whom were teenagers. Um, and there's been a bit of a question around, not questioning the quality of the film. Apparently, it's a brilliant film. But I bring up a similar question that happened after 9-11 of when is it too soon to dramatize a major act of violence or an act of terrorism, um, both in terms of what is appropriate, but also in terms of collective consciousness, what is healthy for audiences to be able to take. And that, I mean, that was a, that, the, the biggest example I can think of that was around 9-11, because, I mean, you had Paul Greengrass's own film, United 93, which is a masterpiece, but also one of the most unwatchable films I've ever come across, because it's just so utterly harrowing. But then you have films that are a little bit more tepid, like Oliver Stone's World Trade Center. And there was a question of, is, is like, the healing process that film can offer, in, with that films like Schindler's List or 12 Years a Slave or Selma, like, have been able to kind of offer... Is this too soon for that healing process to start? Mm. And is it just a little bit too much? Well, I guess what you're referring to in all those films is uh, something that comes at the very least decades after the events have actually occurred. Yeah. Um, even with, I mean, the most recent one you would have been referring to there is, is Selma. Yeah. And that's still many decades after the, the events happen. So, yes. But having said that, we now live in a totally different world to what that previously was. We now live in a world where 24-hour news cycles are a thing and yes. um, people are so used to this churn of information and things just keep moving. So maybe because of that, we have a smaller toleration to how long the public has to wait before we can kind of confront these again. There's also something very particular about the way that Greengrass approaches, because he's made quite a few films about acts of historical violence, I mean, apart from United 93, Um, which benefits entirely from the fact that he has this particular skill as a director. His film Bloody Sunday is very similar. He came from a documentary background, so he approaches these events with a very objective eye, which often makes them far more affecting and far less exploitative because you're not watching... You're kind of not watching a piece of entertainment. I mean, that's the, the the really interesting thing about the difference between the way that a filmmaker like Greengrass approaches these kind of events to the way a more traditional Hollywood and inverted commas style approach would take it. Um, That said, I mean, Peter Berg is a pretty Hollywood standard director in his film about the Boston bombings, Patriot's Day, that came out last year, I Mm. found fascinating and very beautifully made. Um, But again, it was a question of going, oh, is the distance of time not working in this film's benefit? It seems to be one of those situations where... I don't know if it's necessarily anniversaries or whatever the case is, but these things seem to come in pairs as well, like you were referring yeah. to with the um, the Boston Marathon bombing. There was also Jake Gyllenhaal's uh, Stronger, which I felt was very weak. If you want to go check out my review at maketheswitch.com.au, I thought it was a pretty <laughs> atrocious film comparatively to Patriot's Day. Um, but it's the same situation with the, um, the massacre here as well that you're talking about. There's actually two films coming out of this, the same situation situation you had with the World Trade Center reference so it's it's this weird thing where they kind of they come in waves it's like it's a bit of a trend I guess Mm. because what would you think if you go if like someone in Australia made a movie based on the the Port Arthur massacre yeah you see that mm, yeah I was I was thinking that because I mean I made a piece of theater a few years ago about the Columbine massacre and this was a question that we were asking and someone actually asked us that they said why aren't you making one about Port Arthur Mm. because that's Australian and there's just something 
I don't know. Like, I think there are certain historical events where it's just, it feels a little bit like it's crossing a line. I mm. feel a little bit the same about this with, with the Anders Breivik thing. If there's just something so immediate and personal about it, because mm. it's not like destruction. It's not, it's not an explosion. It's not an act of extreme terrorism on infrastructure as well as lives. Mm. It's direct contact between human lives. I feel like that might be the reason why we've never approached Port Arthur. But also, we don't have a history of violence on that scale in like, colonial Australia because we completely ignore the fact that we committed acts of extreme atrocious violence before we properly colonised and settled and took over this country from the people that were here before. Mm. Um, so maybe it's that. Maybe we're just not comfortable talking about our own acts of violence. I don't know. It, that's a very big, complicated question. But I guess we get a chance to see this film ourselves, this um, particular film, Paul Greengrass, uh, in October, because it is a Netflix film. Yeah. Um, they supported the film, I guess, because it was such a confronting subject. They were the company that supported the film and, and um, funded it. So we'll get to see whether or not, um, in this particular case for ourselves, whether this is a necessary perspective on, an, on a major historical event of this century, um, an act of extreme violence, or whether it actually does fall on the side of exploitation. I suspect it will probably be the former rather than the latter. On a more positive note, we have some great giveaways up for grabs this week. First up, we have five copies of Ideal Home on Blu-ray. Celebrity chef Erasmus, played by Steve Coogan, and his partner Paul, played by Paul Rudd, have a happy and rather self-indulgent life together. Their perfect existence is turned upside down when, at a dinner party, Erasmus is confronted by the grandson he never knew he had. With the child's father in prison, it seems he has nowhere else to go, and so, after much debate, they decide to take him in. With changes and challenges on both sides, this could prove a recipe for disaster. We also have five copies of This Is Us Season 2 on DVD Up For Grabs. This new season explores the Pearsons' lives. In the past, Rebecca, Mandy Moore, and Jack... Milo Ventimiglia, deal with his drinking problem and their marital issues while trying to raise three very different children. In the present, Kate, Chrissy Metz, reboots her life and career, deepening her relationship with Toby, Chris Sullivan, and Randall, Sterling K. Brown, decides to expand his family through adoption. For your chance to win this and all of our great giveaways, head to maketheswitch.com.au forward slash comps now. And before we go, we'd like to offer you some cinematic inspiration, with each of us suggesting one film that you should see this week and why. Uh, For me, I'm going back a couple of Christmases. Um, uh, One of the things I love to do on Christmas, because I'm a bit of a Grinch, is go and see a movie, because the cinemas are open and they're usually dead quiet. So one that I saw on Christmas Day of 2009 was a little film called Nowhere Boy, which is this really interesting biopic on John Lennon, but not John Lennon as we know him in The Beatles, more the really, really early days when he started the band, and it's much more about his relationship with his mother than anything, and this kind of really tangled uh, relationship that the two of them have, and how she kind of was and was not in his life for so long um and kind of how he got into the whole musical side of things because of essentially her absence it has a very early role from aaron taylor johnson as uh, john lennon and he does a superb job back when he was aaron taylor no aaron aaron johnson aaron johnson yeah because then he went and married the director of the film nowhere boy strange but true but also has fucking amazing in every role but a really great performance from Kristen Scott Thomas. She's great in this as kind of the um, the sister of John's mother who looks after John. And Aaron Taylor Johnson is so hot, it's almost <laughs> impossible to deal with. Like much hotter than the bit in 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 um, Nocturnal Animals where he's taking a dump on the on the front porch. So much hotter. <laughs> I mean, it's only uphill from there. Yes. So anyway, my recommendation is definitely check out the very small but very worthwhile Nowhere Boy. All right, Daniel, it's your turn. What have you got? Well, I know that there's been a bit of a theme lately on the podcast of particularly from Jess and Brent and talking about going back on films that were formative in your childhood and all that kind of stuff. But fuck that nostalgia gazing. Like, what the (laughs) fuck? That's just lazy. So I'm going for like top class, high level cinematic classics. This week, I'm going to recommend one of the most, possibly the most beautiful looking film maybe ever made. 
um, which is Powell and Pressburger's 1948 masterpiece, The Red Shoes. So it's oh. about yes, it's about um, a, it's about the ballet world. Don't let that fool you, though. It is um, a very um, dense, intense, beautiful, damning, vicious film about the sacrifices that artists make for their art. Um, it has incredible performances, has possibly the most beautiful technical cinematography ever captured on film. Um, it's a major influence on basically on films like Black Swan. Um, I think Perfect Blue was also influenced by it. Um, it's yeah, it's just one of the greatest films ever made. Um, often by many directors, like named as one of their favorite films. Um, and just you will just you've never seen anything more fucking beautiful with color in your life. 1948 masterpiece, The Red Shoes. Watch it. Do not regret it. Well, Jake, both Daniel and I have come up with very creative musical-oriented films. I'm sure you have something along those lines too. Yeah, has Nicolas Cage made one of those? <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah, Rumblefish. That was that was a music. That was it like a musical entry? Yeah, maybe. But um, no, not Rumblefish this week. Um, I am. <laughs> I was talking about Searching um, before. So on that note, I'm going to recommend um, another masterpiece: uh, the 2010 documentary film Catfish. Um, directed by Henry Joost and Ariel Schulman. Catfish is a really, um, but well, besides, you know, uh, being responsible for actually coining the term catfishing, Catfish is a really, really bad documentary. Um, it is like, it's staged. It is like, ob- obviously staged. Um, I was going to ask, do you think it, is it real? Is it real? No way. I've never no been able to get a real answer on that one. <laughs> no, no. And um, uh, I don't I particularly like Ariel Schulman either. I think the guy is like a real creeper. But if you view Catfish as like a thriller, it is an awesome movie. So if you take it like at um, at total face value, it is just like so um, tense and um, and interesting. And um, you know, for those who don't know, um, Ariel Schumann's like sort of this young, good-looking dude um, living in um, New York. He's a photographer. He um, hooks up with this chick um, via Facebook, who is this like sort of you know babe who's into him. Um, so he go, goes across the country to, to meet her because she's like really elusive um, about meeting up. And um, gradually he sort of like starts finding more and more, you know, holes in her, um, her story and um, her online persona. And, uh, you know, eventually he and his uh, friend, um, who, you know, they're filming the entire thing. And, you know, he's led to like a, this, um, you know, post office box in the middle of nowhere. And then eventually this kind of rundown farm. And it looks like the movie's going to go into, like the documentary is going to go in this like sort of, you know, almost a, um, you know, Hills Have Eyes style uh, direction. And actually, like, do feel, like, tense for them. You do, like, you do kind of, like, feel like this could turn into, like, a legitimate horror movie. You know, as, like, completely, you know, odious as Catfish the TV show is, like the MTV reality TV series that spun off from from this documentary, and, um, you know, ethically questionable um, Ariel Schumann and, and Henry Joostar, I still think this documentary has like some value and um, I really recommend just like sort of uh, just checking it out with an open mind. Well, some great suggestions for you this week and you can find all the links to the articles we've talked about on this week's podcast at maketheswitch.com.au. Please subscribe to Switchcast on iTunes, Spotify or your favourite podcast platform and don't forget to rate us. Stay in touch on Twitter as well. I'm at Charlie underscore David. Daniel? At Daniel Lamon. And Jake. At Jake Chatty. Like it, follow it. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Make the Switch AU to stay up to date with all the latest reviews, news, trailers, and giveaways. And you can find all the notes and links to everything we've discussed in this week's podcast, as well as other other episodes by visiting switchcast.com.au. On next week's show, I'll let you know if Eli Ross, the house with a clock in its walls, starring Kate Blanchett and Jack Black, ticked all the right boxes. Plus, Jess will have her reviews for both Ladies in Black and the doco I Am Paul Walker. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you all next week.